Good morning, all, and a very happy new year to everybody. I hope you all had a better new year than I did after hibernating over Christmas because I wanted to go away over the new year. I contracted COVID, which isn't nice. Uh, so if you've had it, I'm glad you've recovered. If you've not had it, try avoid it like the plague. But today, I've recovered, and we're now going to talk about the first webinar of 2022, which is on strategy. So at the end of the session, I've also got an announcement, which I think you should be excited about, about some of the webinars we're going to do in the future. But I've got some stats on strategy. And this stat, these stats have all come from a company called Castade, who are the number one strategy execution platform in the world. So did you know that last year, 67% of all leaders believed their organization had a, or were good at crafting strategy but only 47 believe that organization were actually good at implementing strategy. And only 10% of those organizations surveyed, and that's at least two thirds of the strategy objective, said that 36% of the companies will achieve 50% of the strategy, and only 54% of the uh, companies said they would achieve less than 50%. So 54% of companies thought they believe they would achieve less than 50% of their strategy. 2% of leaders are confident that they will achieve 80% of their strategic objectives. Wow, that's quite an interesting one. And 18% say that hiring of people with the necessary business skills or leadership talent to drive strategy implementation was high on their agenda. And only a mere 11% said that developing those skills among their existing staff was important. 50% of leaders rate implementation as equally important as the strategy. However, only 42% of managers and 27% of employees actually get access to the strategic plan. So how do you implement it if less than half your staff get hold of the plan? 80% of the workforce primary motives were about putting extra energy into the change plan, but they hadn't tapped into the leadership spine of the business to enable to them to do that. Fewer than 33% of senior executives report a clear understanding of the connection between the corporate business strategy and priorities and the actual business themselves. And only 16% of frontline supervisors and managers understood any part of the connection between the strategy and business delivery. 64% of successful companies build their budget based on their strategy rather than building their budget based on behaviors and the three reasons why strategic implementations fail are poor communication lack of leadership and using the wrong measures so we've got lots to sort of look at today and build on today today we're joined with paul uh, with dave pie uh, paul uh, jacobs cried off this morning forgetting that he was interviewing with a client his diary planning has not improved from 2022, that's for certain. Heather is delivering some diversity training for a client down in Bristol, uh, which is really good. And Paul Sharp is somewhere in the northwest, I believe. So, Dave, Happy New Year to you. I hope you're well. Uh, so let's kick off today. Um, why is strategy so important to the growth of a business? Morning, H, and Happy New Year, everyone. I'm not glad to be back, and I uh, hope your business and your new year has started well. It's an interesting thing, isn't it, strategy? There are so many books. If you go to Waterstones, you can look at the business section, and probably the biggest shelf or the, mo the shelf with the most books on is one on strategy. And I remember attending an IOD event a number of years ago where um, a, a chap spoke very, very eloquently for about half an hour to a, an assembled group of business executives about strategy. And it was, a, it was a bit of a dull talk, to be fair. And then the chairwoman of Skyscanner, the, the online airport place came in and she just stood up and she said, culture, eats strategy for breakfast, which is a famous Peter Drucker quote, and kind of undermined everything he said. She didn't do it deliberately, but she did it from the point of view of, um, actually, you've got to have the culture and the strategy to make it work. But how she concluded her talk was, you can't have a culture if you haven't got a strategy, because you won't know what your culture is and how it fits into your business. So why is it so important, H? Because it it's the glue that holds everything together. 
And, you know, if you look at, um, if you remember those Airfix models, Howard, do you remember those? When I, the do, I do remember that? Airfix models, yes. Yeah, you remember those? And they, they used to come, didn't they, in, in, a, in a plastic kind of web with every little bit joined together. And then you had to put it together. Well, strategy is a bit like that. You couldn't put it together if you didn't have either the picture or the manual to, to put it together. You kind of looked at it and you got the glue and you got it all over your fingers and it all got very messy, but you knew what you were building. You, you were building a Land Rover, you were building a plane, whatever it was. And that, for me, is the essential importance of strategy. It's the glue that puts and holds everything together. I think what you're saying there, Dave, is what I completely agree is that what you're saying is that if you've got a vision of where you want to go and you know understand what that vision looks like if you then build all the way back to the building blocks to create that vision that's what you need for your strategy all the things that go down the line to end up with the vision at the end actually becomes reality at the end and i think a lot of people sort of look at strategy and think that you know it's a bit of a faff it's too hard work we write strategy, strategic plans every year and we never actually pick up on them. And I think that's because they don't truly know where they're going from point A to point B. And therefore, when we start to connect all the dots together, which gives them a proper roadmap, then all of a sudden strategic planning becomes really sort of paramount in the forefront of driving good businesses. And I was with a client on, on Monday and we were talking about strategy. And I said, if you walked into all the big major companies in the world, they will all have a strategy. They will all drive strategy. Yeah. And I remember re reading the reports on Ford in the early 2000s when Ford were millions and billions of pounds of, of in debt and they brought the new ceo in who turned ford around and he said the first day he sat there and a, a man walked in with a big trolley with all of these files on the trolley and he said what's that and he said this is our strategy and he <laughs> said you need to go away and burn that strategy because that strategy has put us billions of dollars in debt we'll create a completely new strategy and develop a new strategy so it even says that even this is a poor strategy or there's a good strategy the top businesses use their strategy to enable them to grow their business and this is a big question that i get asked quite a lot when i go see companies is they all I always say, you know, show me a strategy and they bring a strategy out or they're pulling things out of the head when nine times of, out of 10, what they're actually bringing out is what's a budget. So what's the difference between having a true strategy and a budget? Well, this is probably going to seem like a bit of a glib answer, but if you want to grow your business, you can miss your budget and still grow, but you can't miss your strategy and grow. If you set yourself a direction and you know where you're going, you may not quite get there on the numbers. Your perm numbers may be a little bit down. The idea of opening another office may not happen. Your, your contract temp, that margin may drop. There may be all sorts of reasons why you may not hit that bottom right-hand corner of the Excel spreadsheet. But at least if you know where you're going, you can get there. And a budget is one of the tools that you will use as a leader of your business or your finance person will help you to, to use to get to where you want to go. And putting a budget together just based on last year's run rate. So if you are sitting there in January now and either your year, year ends at the end of the tax year in March or your year ends at the end of the calendar year in December, and you're thinking, I haven't done my budget yet, and we've all been there. Don't beat yourself up out about it. We've all been there. But now you're sitting in January trying to put your budget together. That's fine. But if it isn't in the framework of a strategy, so you know where you're going, then you, you are going to struggle because you may hit your numbers, but you may be going in the wrong direction. So there's that lovely, lovely line, isn't it? Um, if, you, if you're climbing the ladder, when you get to the top, make sure it's leaning against the right wall. And often we come across companies whose ladder is just leaning against the wrong wall and they've got there and they realise that's not where they want to be. They've hit the numbers, but they haven't got to where they want to be. I think what we sometimes find is that when they get to the top of that ladder, it's not actually leaning against anything. <laughs> it's just balancing in midair. And I think, yeah. you know, that, that comment that 64% of companies build their budget based on their strategy rather than 
past behaviors is really important. And when we start to sort of look into what people like Steve Jobs was doing, he wasn't building a budget based on past behaviors. He built a budget based on what the strategy of the business was and where the business is, how the business is growing. And what he did was then was link that strategy into the budget. And that's that bit where you start to sort of grow a bigger business where people start to understand that's my budget. This is how it fits into the, into the overall budget. And this is how it fits into the strategy. But this is how the strategy is going to help me actually achieve my budget and i think that's the bit that we just sort of throw budgets out to our, our staff and we throw budgets out to our managers and say off you go go hit those budgets but there's nothing then actually linking that back to how and that question how sort of comes up time and time again how are you going to grow how are you going to develop what are you going to do and yeah, you, know, you could have a budget put in, and, and it's interesting. I remember sort of managing certain certain parts of businesses, and managers were hitting their budget, but they were hitting their budget by not recruiting people because they were saving the operational costs of recruiting people, but forgetting that further down the line, because they were happy in January, February, March, not bringing people in. But forgetting in September, October, November, those people now should be billing a certain amount of money. So they'll get further and further away from the budget. So they didn't understand the operational importance of that part of the strategy of recruiting at the right time to feed the chain further down the line. So I think the difference between strategy and budget is hugely different. So if you've just got a budget, it's then how does that link to the growth of the business and what does that mean to the growth of the business? And that's where strategy should, should come in. And yeah. Yeah. Again, when you talk about bringing people in, if we think about bringing five, let's think about bringing 10 people into the business and we expect each person to be billing 10K a month, so 120K a year, 10 people, that's approximately a million pounds in a year, but you're not going to get that in year one because we know in year one, it's a building phase. So actually the two-year strategy says at the end of year one, if we've got all of those 10 people at a run rate of 10K, then year two is where we earn the million pounds. But if you haven't done that and even thought about from a budget point of view or a strategic point of view, then you're never going to get there. So that strategy side and the budget side is really important. So the question is, having both is important, but how do you make it link, Dave? How do you make those two things link together? Now, Howard, I'm in danger of doing what we never do on these webinars, and that's a little bit of a sales pitch for Jump. Oh, Dave, we're Dave, really, Dave, can I mute you? Can I mute you? We're, we're, we're really good at not selling our services, but actually one of the key services that we provide, and, and I think, and you would probably say I would say this, wouldn't I? Um, one of the key things that's missing is helping organisations and leaders to put a plan together. So we have one of these. This is our, our jump forward plan, and we created that to answer that very question of, how do you link budget and strategy, vision and mission? How do you put it together? Um, and I have a saying that you will have heard me say, those that have been on this, um, these webinars for the last couple of years, that, that strategy is episodic, not annual. And that's because we all know that recruitment changes from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday, you know, and it goes like this, as we know. It never goes like that. And having a jump forward plan enables you as an owner to have something to refer back to, to hold you accountable to, to enable you to have a living, breathing document, which pulls it all together. And we spend a lot of time with the clients that we work with. And I think have probably 60 or 70% of our clients have got a jump forward plan. Um, you can go to Waterstones and you can buy a book. You can go onto countless websites. There's all sorts of places you can go to get strategy advice. But, but actually having something that you work up one-to-one -one with and are held accountable for, I really think does help. So forgive me for those of you watching this thinking that is a bit of a sales pitch because it is, but it is one key way of making sure you've got something to hold accountable to, to deliver, and it captures all the basics of your, of your business. So it's interesting that when we say link them together, so we go and talk to clients and we have long conversations about their gross profit line 
and how their staff are growing their gross profit line. But when we talk to them and say, one of the things that we ask on that jump forward plan is, um, do your people understand the vision and mission of your business? And it's really interesting how many people say, no, probably not. And how many of them actually say, I don't know what that is either. I'm not 100% <laughs> uh, of what, what yeah. that is. And so when you start to link them together, what we start to think about is if I want someone to bill a certain amount of money or I want a, a manager to bring in a certain amount of GP from his team, if I just give them the budget, then that's a figure that they're aiming at. But if I give them all the tools and enable them to do that, then it's a lot easier for them to hit budget. So actually for them to know what the strategy is, how they fit into that strategy jigsaw, to me is how you link them together. Yeah. So everybody should understand what the strategy is and how the strategy works, what their part of the strategy is and what would elevate them to the next level so they can take extra parts of that strategy which is all about promotion. So if you start to link them together in that fashion, what we start to get is people to see why they're doing certain things and what the outcome for the business and for them will be. And that's the important part of strategy is that if you just give people a budget, then that's all they focus on. And I know for a fact that the reasons why we give someone an annual budget, then we break it down quarterly, then we break it down monthly, and then we break it down weekly. Because what actually happens in our brain, our brain sorts that budget out in our head and it says, right, I've got a bill, 120K. So 120K by December, that sits in my head in December. But I've got to do X amount of CVs, interviews, et cetera. That's part of strategy. How many interviews, et cetera, to hit that budget? So we give little bits of it, but it's the simple bit just to hit that budget number. But when we talk about growing staff, growing the business and developing the business, how that all links together to say to, I was with a client uh, yesterday and I said, if you think about your managers, if they think what they are billing this year, it will have a huge effect next year if you retain more staff, but then how we develop, train and onboard them becomes more part of that. Then they're involved now in the parts of strategy for onboarding, they're involved in the strategy for training, they're involved in the strategy for their initial recruitment. They're now getting a full understanding of different parts of the strategy and how they link things together. So making sure everyone understands the strategy, I think, is the first thing that makes it link together. And then under them understanding what benefit is it for them and the business starts to link it. So when we talk about strategy, what's the most important factor of a strategy? And I guess how there's, there's lots of different answers to this, but for me, the most important factor is the execution of it. Because it's where many leaders and many companies slip up. They have a roadmap, they have a plan, they have a direction of where they want to go, but other things get in the way and they begin to deviate from the direction they were going in. Um, I have a question that I ask when I chair a board meeting with some of the companies that I'm involved in, and I will say, what have you stopped doing this month from last month? Because as leaders, we find it very easy to take on so much because the demands of our time, the demands from our clients, from our candidates, from our industry even, it is quite significant. And at the moment, we're in a very boom market. It's really good for most recruiters. It's a really good time. And we want to make hay. We want to make as much as we can while these times are good. However, we still got to remain strong on the execution of the plan because otherwise other things come along and they take us off in a different direction. And it may be a direction that may look good, but if it isn't part of a plan, then it can, it can deviate from your success. Alternatively, you may have a strategy that says, and actually, we want to open up in a new market. We want to try a new sector. We want to try a new service. And this is how we're going to do, go about doing it. And that's fine. So then the execution comes on, well, how are you getting on doing it? Who's accountable for it? How's it going to be delivered? How's it going to be woven into the brand and the values that you espouse as a business? That's all good, because that's part of the strategy. But for me, it's execution. When I was at Spring and we were looking at companies to buy, 
most of the time, most of the reason why a company was not successful in selling to a big company like ours was because they hadn't executed on their strategy. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I talk an awful lot to, to my clients about four parts of what strategy should look like. And the last part, which I think is the most important part, is that your strategy should be driving cash into your bank. Yeah. And I see a lot of companies that are, you know, turnover rich, but cash poor. But if you want to actually build a business, you need cash in your bank. So to sort of add into your little bit there, I always look at the strategy, the execution of that strategy. Do the people like that strategy and the people being your consultants, your managers, your clients, your candidates and your suppliers? And then finally, does that strategy then drive cash into the bank? So all the time, what we should be looking at is when we look at our strategy and we're segmenting it into individual little parts of strategy, then we start to look at those individual sectors and start to think, right, okay, this sector is for A. How are we executing it? Are we executing it well? Do the people like it? Does it drive cash to the bank? Because you might have the worst strategy, but it's executed well and people love it and it's driving cash into the bank. So the question is, if we improve the strategy, would it drive more cash into the bank? You might have what you think is the best strategy, it's not executed very well because the people don't like it and therefore it's not driving cash into the bank. So therefore we need to address that part of the strategy and rechange that strategy. So I think the most important part of strategy is that it should drive cash into the bank, but it needs to be fluid and changed based on what people are doing. So if you don't keep measuring your strategy in each individual part of it, then you don't know whether it's succeeding or not. And that's the bit which lots of people get the problems with is that they start the strategy, it's failing, and therefore then they stop doing anything rather than going back to have a look at it and look at reason why it's failing. And that could be the execution. It could be that the people just don't like it. How many times we come across this all the time, David, we, 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 we talk about this constantly, that how many times do we have a company say, I'm going to implement a new CRM? So the yeah. strategy is to implement a new CRM. The execution is they repopulate the data from their old CRM and the CRM provider does a basic training on that CRM. The people initially think what a great idea and they like it, but then they start to go into it and guess what happens? They start to go back. Why isn't it like the old system or why isn't it this? And therefore they stop using it because they don't understand the power of it because actually in the execution, we haven't put in extra training, extra development, extra measurements to make sure people are doing the right thing and people like it. So it doesn't actually get outside of the business to see whether the candidates or the clients like it, but we never then actually go back to the supplier enough to see how much they can help it therefore it's never going to drive enough cash into the bank because people aren't using it properly so the initial strategy is fine it's the execution that needs changing in that part to make the people like it and enjoy it and therefore that's the bit where strategy starts to work and you start to think you've got to change individual parts whether the strategy or the execution to ensure that people do enjoy it because if the people don't enjoy it then the strategy is never going to go anywhere it's never going to be delivered so the question then that when we get i get asked this question a, a fair bit what are the non-negotiables that you should have in your strategy well i think there's there's a lot for me your business can be broken down into two focuses one focus is on income things like the operations productivity training systems um delivery servicing clients how you get your income and how you make the best of it and the other focus from a strategic point of view is asset which is how you are building your brand to create something of more value an asset would look at things like leadership and purpose and people and culture um, developing equity and channels and all of those things income and asset are equally important Many companies and many leaders will focus on how do I grow my numbers, which is all about income. And that's important because we know, as you said, Howard, without cash, without income, you can't survive. But equally as important 
and this would also depend upon what your plan for your business is. If your plan is to have a lifestyle business and you never want to sell it, you just want it to maintain a nice income, then income is perhaps the most important thing. But if you have a different vision of your future as a leader, then building the asset of your business is going to be as important, if not more important, from your strategic plan. So it's for me, the, the, the two non-negotiables are having a strategy that's based around building your asset and a strategy based around building your income and weaving those together. It's interesting, we, we talk about the urgency of recruitment and the urgency of recruitment is fill jobs, fill jobs, fill jobs, fill jobs. But then we talk about why is it in the UK, and there's a, a reportedly 40,000 recruitment agencies in the UK, why is 90% of them not more than 10 heads? So 90% of all recruitment agencies in the UK have less than 10 heads. And the reason is because they are so focused on the income side, fill jobs, fill jobs, fill jobs, they're not focused on the strategic side. So I'm always thinking if the non-negotiable things are, if you're thinking like a five-man business and you are a five-man business, then growing to a six-man business is really hard. But if you're a five-man business thinking like a 20-man business, growing to 10 heads is quite easy. If you're a 10-man business thinking like a 50-man business, and to be a 50-man business, you have to have strategy in place to ensure that you are then generating enough money to break even and to make lots and lots of profit. So to me, the non-negotiables on these type of things is very simple, is that if we are putting strategy in place, it has to be based around the growth of the people and therefore they need to understand the strategy and it has to complement the budget to ensure the budget is actually achievable because again if you start to put a budget that's too high it becomes a negative impact on the business yes we can slightly miss our budget and that's fine but if we miss it by miles it has a massive negative impact on our business so i think we, it's about having those two things the non-negotiable side is that everyone should understand the strategy absolutely to the nth degree and our budget should be based around the strategy not based around the overall development of the people or what they've delivered the, the following year because if you forever go i, I remember been at, uh, at Lorien and I remember billing an extraordinary amount of year in year in in probably year three or year four and then being told the following year irrespective I had to bill 50% more the following year why because everybody in the business had been targeted to bill 50% more yeah my 50% more mean I had to build oh, well over a million pounds Mm. Yeah, and it was just an astronomical target that I never got anywhere near. But however, that target didn't do anything for my promotion. Didn't do. It didn't change how I was paid on commission. It just completely demotivated me. So it wasn't actually linked to anything yeah. from there, from a strategic mm. point of view. And it's those little things that demotivate people and stop people actually delivering and hitting the strategic side, but also can prevent people hitting the budget side. So to me. Everyone should understand the strategy and the budget should be built around the strategy so people can actually move away. We started to talk quite a lot about the strategy. Should the strategy be flexible or should it be rigid? I think we've started to answer that question. Let's put that in a little bit more context, Dave, of whether the strategy should be flexible or whether it should be rigid. Um, well, I would love if recruitment were rigid and we knew what was going to happen tomorrow or next week. I mean, I've been in it 135 years or whatever the number is, and um, I don't think it's ever been rigid. Um, it's one of those few um, sectors that literally changes every day. And as we know, the people we can place to start on a Monday may not turn up. Uh, when you sell a product, you know you've sold the product. You've got a bike, it, it turns up, there it is. Our, our, our sales can walk off the next day. So... That's our industry. So therefore, our strategy also has to be flexible. Now, flexible doesn't mean not having an excuse for not having one in the first place. You've got to have one, but it's got to have a degree of flexibility. 
depending on what happens in the markets, depending on the sectors you're working in. Um, for those in engineering, they will hear on the news this morning that the, the building of the smart motorways has just stopped. Now, whether you have an opinion on that, or whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, if you're supplying contractors or permanent staff to the construction people, then that's going to affect your strategy if that's one of the things that you're working on. So it has to be flexible. You've got resource on that, you've got to deviate that resource to somewhere else. So um, I, I think absolutely it has to be flexible. And I'll use that line again. It's episodic, not annual. Things change regularly. And I think if you just look over the last two years, you know, what coronavirus has done and how we've pivoted, changed, but not just changed the way we recruit, but changed, you know, how we automate things, how we approach clients, how we approach candidates. And it's interesting, a lot of agencies are very fixated sort of on that. How many jobs have we got? How many jobs? How many jobs? And now we've got so many jobs, we don't know what to do with them. But we've suddenly fixated very much on how many candidates have we got. And, you know, we keep saying, and I've been saying for years and years and years, I don't care how many jobs you've got on. If you haven't got any candidates to fill those jobs, yeah. those jobs are useless. So what it means is that, you know, if we're forever rigid on focusing on one thing, then what happens if that focus or the market then dictates to focus on another thing? So we've got to start to change our focus constantly all the way around to ensure that we are acting to the pressures that's put on us by the marketplace and we are doing the right things. So I always think the only things that we never change, or I never say change in the budget, if we put a three-year plan in place and the three-year strategy is to hit a certain number, that number is rigid and never changes. But the route to that number may it's change. Yeah. So the rigidness is in that number. So it should never go down. It should stay there. But if it goes up, then we will stretch people to get there. But that figure is the original figure that we aimed at, and we will leave that figure as is all the time. So that's the only rigid thing. But the route to get there, and as you mentioned, motorways, etc. if you're driving somewhere and all of a sudden there's a crash on the motorway and you can get off, then you go a different route. It might take you a little bit longer, etc. but you take that different yeah. route to bypass that problem. That's flexibility that's what your strategy is the goal and the budget or the goal and the target is to get to the end point the strategy is what actually gets you there so sometimes you may have to go around the houses so therefore that flexibility needs to be there yeah. so the question that again i've been asked three times this week is who is accountable for the strategy so for me, it is the leader, the founder, the MD, the CEO, whatever title that you may have. Um, him or her and his or her board are accountable for the strategy. The buck has to stop somewhere and the buck would stop with the, the leader of the business or the founder, however the business is run. But how do you made a very important, or you gave us a very important stat at the beginning of this, of this talk, where you said that 42% of managers and 27% of staff don't ever get to see the strategy. So whilst the accountability, in my eyes, is held with the most senior person or the most senior team that you have built around you, if you haven't shared that with your team and you haven't got the views of your team, then you are going to struggle. Someone's got to be accountable, but you've got to share it. You've got to have that team session where you share your vision, you share your strategy, you share the direction you're going in with your team. doesn't mean they're all accountable for it in the same way, but of course they're accountable for their part at their desk. And if they can see the vision and the strategy and the purpose and they admire your leadership, then the work that they do to help become part of that company, to help it get to where it needs to get to, will seem much more valuable. And they will feel much more empowered and they will feel much more involved in the business. So ultimately it rests with the leader of the business, but hopefully that person is wise enough and intelligent enough to share it and let people know what's going on. So yeah, obviously I can't disagree with that because that's absolutely right. The, the, the end accountability is on that, you know, the owner 
of the strategy. And if we go back to what we said right at the beginning about, did you know that 67% of leaders believe that organization had a good crafted strategy, but only 47% believed of the organizers that they would deliver that strategy, that starts to tell you that that accountability is either very weak with the owner, and that's where we get employed quite a lot to keep people accountable to that strategy, but their ability to delegate things down to the people and keep them accountable is also probably reasonably weak and that's the bits when we talk about connecting the dots together and what you were talking about is everybody understanding that strategy and where they play is when people start to connect the dots of that strategy and accountability becomes quite obvious and this is where we talk about creating habits in accountability and it's interesting when you sort of read an awful lot on on on, on creating habits and culture with habit is um, if we can create some really strong keystone habits around accountability, then other things automatically follow after that. And to give you a prime example of that, if, if, you, if you start running and running becomes a habit, so the habit is running and that's the keystone habit. But when people have then analysed what happens to people who create that habit and that as a keystone habit, they start to eat better, eat more healthily. That's not the habit that we told them to be or what we should told them to be accountable for, but they started to do that. We then started to talk about they started to sleep more, they started to stretch more, they started to do lots of different things that became habit from that keystone. So if we create accountability as a keystone habit from the top to the bottom down and back up again, then what we start to create then is everyone taking accountability for their part of the strategy, but they'll also take for accountability for other things. And there's a, a very famous sort of uh, article written about uh, American Illuminian and the man that came in and said, right, I'm not going to talk any part of business other than about business safety. My strategy is all about business safety. And he made it the most safest place to work, you know, red hot metal everywhere. He made it the safest place to work in America. They had a better safety record than IBM, where you're just sat at a desk typing. And that's really interesting. But he said what that created was that people then started to create habits about safety that created habits about other things yeah. and this then started to drive productivity and drove everything and made them a really really one of the richest businesses in the in, in america and it was all about creating the habit the keystone habit that then created other little habits so if we think about accountability as a habit and they became a ha accountable for safety that drove everything else so what is it that you need to be accountable for? What do you want everybody is accountable for? That will drive the other habits within the business. So I think it's really important that we look at accountability and we then spread that accountability right across the business. But the ultimate ownership stands with the person that owns the strategy, which is generally the business owner. Yeah. Yeah. So the big question is then, what happens if you lose your way? Well, if you're on your own and you haven't shared it with anybody and you feel that you're the only one that can make a difference, then you're going to become ill and you're going to get stressed and you're going to react to knee-jerk things that you wouldn't normally react to. If you've spread the load among your top team or among your whole company and you begin to lose your way, not only will you know that, but others will know that as well and they're more likely to be on your side as you weave and navigate into a different direction because you've gone the wrong way. And when you, you said in the, the question, what happens if you lose your way? Actually, often it's when you lose your way because it, it rarely just goes completely smoothly. I've said that before, it's up and down. So there are times when you turn the wrong corner and it's a cul-de-sac. And you just got to go back, look at where you're headed to and why, what was the purpose that you set up your company for? What is the end game for you, for your family and for your company? Go back to that. And if I'm losing my way, right, how do I get back to that? What have I lost? 
do I need some help? External help, internal help, whatever it is. Um, if you lose your way, first thing to do, hands up, I've lost my way. Let's see what we can do to help. Or do you know people who can help you? Or do you, can you go back to where you started? You know, that That's, for me, that's just part of your strategy and the way you run your business. There are going to be times when you're going to lose your way. See, it's interesting, isn't it, that lose your way. And I'm going to put this from a very male perspective. And I'm, I hope the, the females on the on the the call will understand what I'm talking about because they've probably been in this situation and seen it happen. If you're driving from point A to B, and quite often you get lost, the male dominance is I know where I'm going and I'm carry on going and I'll go blindly and carry on blindly where I know with Helen she'll go let's stop let's find that where we are so we know where we are and redirect ourselves so to me if we start to lose our way it's about stop breathe think and then redirect yourself to where you should be and that's what you're talking about there Dave is getting yourself back to the original purpose your original why you're doing certain things that's part the main part of the strategy then you'll start to refocus on what's going on so if you do start to lose the way that if you're spreading accountability then obviously other people will tell you that you're losing your way but then it's about having that ability to stop so to me if you lose your way it should be not when it's if but it's how often are you reviewing your strategy? How often are you measuring what's happening? If you're measuring what's happening, then prevention is better than the cure. If you're not measuring it, the cure is what you're going to have to sort of suck and see. So you've got to look at it. So if you think about now how sat navs work, they're telling you constantly all the way where you're going and what's happening. Yeah. That's the check and balance. That's the review that you're going the right way and doing the right thing. It doesn't just say leave your house and then we'll tell you when you get to the destination. Leave your house, turn left, go 200 yards, turn right. You'll be on this road, go here. So it keeps you on strategy but what happens when if you turn off because you think there's a quicker way it reroutes and retalks you and then re either directs you back yeah. or yeah. then carries on that new route yeah. so that to me is because they're already reviewing constantly where they are getting lost that you tend not to get lost by using a, a sat nav so it's doing those type of things rather than blindly plowing on without having a vision without having a look and being too proud maybe to change stop think and breathe and change and readdress that strategy yeah so the last question is who should have the input into building the strategy and keeping the people accountable yeah and i think we've covered this in some respects in what we said how but uh, yeah. almost i want to say as many people as possible now if you're running an organization of 70 people you're not going to get 70 people in a room. But you will have a leadership team of four or five, and they may want to get four or five other people from their individual teams in a room. So it kind of, it's built up. Um, you may be there having created your business to say, look, we're going to dominate this market, or we want to take market share, or our purposes, we want to have a new way of engaging with candidates, whatever that may be. Um, make sure the your immediate team who are accountable with you for delivering that, no, um, and that they've communicated that to, to the rest of the company. I, I do, I used to do this thing, I haven't done it uh, in the last few years, so because we haven't had that many on-site meetings, but it used to be the case, you go and see the chief executive of a company, and they would send someone down to greet you, if, particularly if you're in a WeWork office or a Regis office, and they'd very kindly come and take you up in the lift or whatever it may be. And I would always ask that person, what's it like working here? In a, in a very friendly way, and most of the time they'd answer, and say, what's the, what's the big idea of the company? And you're in the lift, and it is literally an elevator pitch. You know, what's the big idea of the company? And often, I would say eight times out of 10, they would say, well, I don't know, I just work here. And yet, they're the first point of contact for so many people. So I would encourage um, all of you who are listening to make sure that you've communicated your strategy and your purpose to all of your staff. And I think that's what we, we, we've sort of put all the way through this as a thread is that there should be a core team that pull that strategy together and then we should take it out to the next level down, the next level down and keep going down because sometimes some people will 
start to question certain bits and therefore you can change and address your strategy all the way so really everyone should be involved at some point yep. in the building of the strategy and everyone should be absolutely involved in the accountability of the strategy so that's our, our conversation on strategy next week we're going to talk about ensuring your business is accountable for achieving your vision so we're going to talk very much about accountability next year and what uh, sorry next week and what that looks like now on the 27th six we were going to talk about the biggest problem business owners have is management of time and how to create more time we've just been asked as a group jump uh to do two sessions at the world recruitment summit on the 26th so what we're going to do is we're going to send you out invites to the two sessions that we're doing you can join either or so at noon we're going to do a master class on transforming your business and then at two o'clock we've got a really high-end panel of experts who are going to talk about growth for your business into 2022 so you're most welcome to attend to that what we're going to do is bounce the uh other uh, webinar to the week after so we're not we're not going to not do the webinar but on wednesday at 12 o'clock and then wednesday at two o'clock we've got those two sessions that are both an hour long so it's a great place to come and see it's a global opportunity it's you will hear from people because we'll be asking the audience questions and things like that. So you'll hear from people all around the globe what's happening in the recruitment marketplace. So feel free to join us. I will get emails out to everybody so you can jump on from there. But that's it from us for this week. Dave, thanks very much for your time. Ladies and gents, okay. thanks for uh, attending. Much appreciated for your support. And happy new year. And let's really look at a very prosperous new year. Ladies Have and gents, a great week, everybody. Thank thanks you. for your time. Okay, bye-bye.